people in. All right, folks are getting admitted. You are new, are you? All right, welcome to those who've just joined. If you would, as you join, uh, please uh, turn off your video and you should be muted as you join. If not, Casey, if you would manage that, uh, the uh, uh, waiting room and video. Gary, welcome. All right, so welcome to the, uh, the weekly town hall by Exit Advisors. Today is a panel discussion with uh, entrepreneurs so we've got uh, George Joseph, we've got Susie Ginsburg and Robert White, all local entrepreneurs that have had great success in the current environment and thriving uh, where others are just trying to survive. So we're gonna talk a lot about what they're doing, what they're seeing in the market and how uh, to, to tackle the environment that we have right now to use it to your advantage and grow. So my name is Jason Knight. I'm part of the Exit Advisors team. Exit Advisors is, is a collective of consultants and business experts and uh, professionals. We help businesses uh, develop strategies for uh, exits. And so uh, we work with them throughout the process of increasing their value and growing their companies. And when the time is right, we help you through the exit process and, and help coordinate both sides of the, of the transaction. So many on this team are, are uh, a part of Exit Advisors, again, from the financial side to the the business brokering side. Uh, my name is Jason Knight. Again, I'm a business coach. I'm an EOS implementer and basically I help fix leadership team issues and help dev develop a strategy for growth. So I'm going to introduce a couple of people. So Al Danto is, is going to help with the coordination of the, uh, the discussions and going to take a few questions. Again, just some logistics. As you join the meeting, you're going to be muted. Uh, we do invite you to raise your hand you should see a, a hand raising um, op option in your uh, participants chat list. If you don't want to raise your hand and, and uh, chime in, well, you're welcome to uh, type in a question in the, the chat. So that will be monitored and we'll, we'll call that out if you don't want to ask the question in person, that's okay. So, so I will be uh, uh, handling that piece, but we want to introduce the team before we get to the Q and A. And so we're going to start with uh, George. Why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, George Joseph. I'm the CEO of Common Bond Bistro Bakery and Brasserie and Positive Recovery Centers, which is a drug and alcohol rehabilitation company uh, located here in Houston. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. It's uh, you know a new world, and so I'm like everybody else, trying to figure it out and working as hard as I can to uh, see what's the best avenue to move forward. Uh, because each day is a new day and each some days it's like groundhog day and some days it's like a whole new day. So thanks for having me. Great. Glad you were able to join. All right, Susie, how about you? Nope, oh, you're muted. Hold on. Hi, I'm Susie Ginsberg and I'm with Global Communication Works. I have literally never seen the excitement, anticipation, um, Time to change as it's been uh, over the last 10 weeks. It has truly brought books like Who Moved My Cheese and The Tipping Point uh, into full reality for us so that we all can practice uh, innovating the new economy and the new world we're, that we're going into. I've been in branding uh, my entire life, 40-year um, veteran, uh, branding, advertising, uh, public relations, crisis management, and, and uh, reputation management help. We have offices in Chicago, New York, and Houston, and we've been helping companies pivot in this time and explore the possibilities and grow and thrive during this uh, new economy. Excellent. Well, welcome. Thank you so much. All right, Robert, how about you? Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Robert White. I am a, uh, an architect and restaurant owner. Um, I run an, a local architecture studio that bears my name. 
out here in Sugarland. And along with uh, my uh, business partner, Victor, we own uh, three restaurant concepts uh, uh, here in Sugarland. Um, they are Japaneros, Guru, and Jupiter. And Japaneros is the oldest one. Uh, she turns 18 this year, actually. And like George, we are trying to, we're doing our best to navigate this uh, challenging times, trying to find opportunity uh, and uh, new avenues to grow our businesses. So, and I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really grateful to Exit Advisors for all this information you guys are putting out there. So it's a thrill. Excellent. Well, thank you again for uh, joining us. All right, Al, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Uh, I'm Al Danto. I'm George, Robert, Susie. I can't tell you how excited I am to have you here. You are three of my absolute favorite entrepreneurs. I've gotten all of you over the years. Um, it's just a joy to have you here. I, I, in addition, I'm a partner in Exit Advisors, but I also teach entrepreneurship at the Jones School of Business at Rice, which is now the number one uh, graduate entrepreneurship program in the country. So I've seen thousands of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, successful, unsuccessful, and um, it's really interesting, but we, we wanted to move. We started these as, as just kind of, you know, hunkering down, fear-based. How do we get through this? How do we act to this? And I knew it was gonna, we we're gonna see the best of true entrepreneurs come out, innovation, ideas, excitement, and uh, probably as hard as it may be to believe to a lot of you on the call, I know Robert, George, and Susie, and even myself and our team here, we're excited about some of the opportunities that are, are gonna come out. So that's what today's all about. Today's all about how do we um, use innovation, creativity, uh, you know, and make, take advantage of, of the situation that's going on around us. Uh, we can't control the situation, but we control how we respond to the situation. So that's what it's all about. So I am really excited to have you three here. It's just gonna be fantastic. Thank you again for joining us. And um, Susie, I'm gonna start with you. I know I've just done some amazing, I put some pressure on you. I know you've done some amazing things. So we've, we've shared it, but um, you know, let us know what you're, uh, working with your clients, what you've done yourself, and, and how you're working through this. Thanks, Al. Well, honestly, pandemic spurs innovation. I had no idea we'd be living through a pandemic or living through history and really creating history right now. So entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, they're actually really pivoting, innovating, and changing their entire operations during COVID-19. And not only maintaining relevance, but truly prospering and thriving in the new economy. So I've had a ton of folks come to me. And, and as I like to say, you call your lawyers when you have a legal issue. You call your CPAs and accounting teams uh, or uh, brokers when you have a, a financial issue. But if you're stuck and you just really don't know how to pivot, how do I change? How do I create my business or change it to meet what's happening in, in the world today? You surround yourself with people that are positive and energetic and, and call in your most creative teams so that you really can have some help pivoting. So Al, I wanna share with you some of the uh, examples that, uh, of companies we've been working with. This is Camp Cloud is a, a, a small summer camp in Virginia. I'm so delighted with what they're doing. They, you know, they had a physical facility. They weren't able to have that because the government uh, put so many uh, mandates on camps to open this summer that they really, really needed to, to change their entire working model. So they have been nose to the grindstone and in 48 hours, we had a new name for the company, Camp Cloud Virtually Anywhere. We had a, a, an entire new roadmap to get them from being a small summer camp in Virginia to an international platform for helping kids learn and grow. Not only is this open to campers, regular campers whose camps are closed and camps can use these platforms to 
uh, help their, uh, their current campers, companies can buy seats now to help all those parents who are pulling their hair out, trying to work from home, trying to be on Zoom calls, trying to uh, get all the work done in the workplace and having their kids hanging on them and, not, and, and, and sitting in front of the TV or video games all day long and being uninspired. This camp is actually a platform where they'll have incredible programs to keep, uh, really experiential programs, to keep them active and excited all day long. So this, in, in, ten, in, in a few short weeks, this small camp went from uh, being a physical camp to a virtual camp. And the beautiful thing, and I don't want to cry as I'm telling you about it, is that a lot of the um, disabled folks and retirees like teachers and, and athletes have an opportunity to teach kids and, and, be, and find a, 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 a be really needed again and get back to work because they're, even if they're in a wheelchair, their physical presence doesn't matter in this virtual solution. So I'm very proud of Camp Cloud and um, uh, I think registration might be any day now. So that's exciting for them. And the next company I wanted to, uh, uh, to share with you is Disinfectant Shield. Another 48 hour uh, company, which was born uh, out of an idea when, um, when a group of veterans uh, and entrepreneurial veterans at that uh, just, uh, found a product, a wonderful product that had only been used by surgical suites to clean them for the last decade. And it was such a beautiful product. It's already uh, FDA um, registered, EPA approved, and it's um, eco-friendly. And it's been used in surgical suites by top surgeons for 10 years, but they are making that product available to everybody from countries to governments to uh, big um, businesses. Uh, and homes. Uh, so they have this marvelous uh, uh, safe disinfectant that not only cleans uh, surfaces that, it's, that have been treated, but protects them for 30 days. And when I think of the opportunities now this creates for folks like the janitorial business and the um, pest control service companies, not only are they going to be able to treat houses, schools, businesses for bugs, but they will be able now to treat for superbugs, creating a whole new business for the uh, pest control companies and the janitorial companies who are sitting thinking, we can't even go into these businesses. Our businesses are dying. What are we going to do? Now, this is open to everybody. And you know what? Once you create the company, the brand, the, um, the foundation, and the roadmap, you can tell everybody about it, have that media is ripe to hear all these new ideas, and they put it out there for you. The, um, the wonderful uh, guy from Disinfectant Shield was uh, eight minutes today on Yahoo Finance their phones are ringing off the hook, and I couldn't be prouder of them. So I'll show you one more company that has been such a delight uh, to uh, work with, and that's Principal Health Systems. They took the Abbott platform and they uh, created the clinics uh, to, um, to provide COVID testing, the latest COVID testing. So Al, if you'll share the next screen, uh, with me. Um, this was a very localized business. So it went, it, it, it was massive. It went everywhere in Houston. And then it made the Associated Press for very important news. And this clinic is now opening all over the country with uh, testing. So again, couldn't be prouder. 
And, uh, and then the next slide will just uh, um, finalize it uh, by, by saying that today is the day to rethink what's possible in your business. So as COVID disrupts the normal day-to-day -day operations of small to mid-sized businesses, and really nearly half of the U.S. workforce hangs in the balance, very creative employers, CEOs, entrepreneurs are taking this time to reset their go-to-market strategies and offerings by changing their operations to meet the demands of their customers, keep their staff employed, and not only stay relevant, but thrive in the new economy. Thanks, Susie. How exciting. And I think, uh, you know, I never really heard it put that way, but, you know, you talk about hiring your CPA for CPA work, a lawyer for legal work. And if you're not the most creative, innovative person, you know, you get to somebody like you or another entrepreneur who can help you think out of the box, right? Like that. Um, just, just fantastic. Uh, George Joseph, um, founder, CEO of Common Bond. And if you haven't been to Common Bond, if you're one of the few people in the city of Houston, get over to Common Bond. Uh, George had a new location that opened up uh, Monday. They really kind of uh, came out of this, uh, a drive through location. And George, I know you're doing a lot of innovative uh, things out there as well. So if you could share some of those with us. Al, it was, um, the, I'm actually not the founder. The founder is a chef in San Francisco making oh. panatones. Roy, he's an amazing guy. Uh, wow, it's hard to follow Susie. You know, you're so excited. <laughs> Susie, you got some good areas like disinfectant and, uh, and uh, testing. I'm selling croissants <laughs> and drug and alcohol treatment. So I'm not as popular as those two companies are, maybe. I don't know, I think most of us would rather have a croissant. Exactly. Delicious. Delicious croissant. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you. Thank you. We're so excited. So, yeah. So, um, you know, when this started to come down, uh, I play basketball a lot, Al. And there's a word in basketball that may not be as sexy in business, but hustle. And it just was like a wake-up call for me when this started to happen. Like, what do we got to do? Think the worst uh, plan, hope for the best, but you think the worst and start planning. So we started, uh, working on, we didn't want to lay anybody off. We started looking at salary cuts, things like that. And then how to move in this environment, because obviously cash is king. And so from the treatment aspect, all, we have 10 outpatient clinics where people drive in there, you know, three times a week for three hours. So how do you make those people safe? So we were already working on a pilot to do Zoom uh, telehealth, uh, virtual telehealth, HIPAA compliant, which is about privacy. And so we just had to ramp that up very quickly. So every office had to, uh, we had to get them accounts, we had to get them set up. And so now all our outpatient centers are on Zoom. And it's a, a area that the insurance companies were slow to pay for. And now it's opened that bag where you can have these Zoom, uh, these telehealth is really changing the medical world. And we're excited about it because what I like is that actually, I think some people actually made better progress because maybe in a group setting, they might be a little more shy, but on a Zoom call, they can be a little more themselves. And so I feel like we actually have helped people more with that uh, environment. Now we're in the stage of bringing people back. So we're putting televisions in our meeting rooms because some people are anxious to get back in person. And obviously you gotta have social distancing. But the ones that are not safe, we keep them on the Zoom and they call, they call in at the same time of the meetings and, and we have them on the eye level of sitting in a chair in a group room. So from that aspect, and obviously we know alcohol and drug use is going through the roof, not so much of the drugs because it's been a little harder for people to get, but the alcohol use is going through the roof through this uh, quarantine time. So we've been getting a lot more people calling for help. Obviously, it's the best time to get help. I'm sure a lot of family members want their alcoholics out of the house, but they're worried about their safety. And now that it's feeling more safe for people, uh, they're more and more seeking help. From the common bond perspective, again, we were working on drive-through uh, opportunities and looking at, we were working on naming and all these things that you work on while you're working on your business. But when these kind of things happen, you have to move a lot faster and you forget about some of the, a lot of little details. So we just started moving quicker there was a space that came available on Heights Boulevard and 6th Street that was a drive-through. And, uh, and we just jumped on it. We contacted the people that were closing. We 
assumed their lease. We jumped fast, we renovated fast, and fortunately we were able to open uh, on Monday, and it's called Common Bond on the Go. And basically it's a drive-through, and then you can also get in internal. And again, we were working on it, but now we, you know, we've probably moved up six months from what we were trying to do based on this environment. And it all goes back to me um, as an employer is to help the culture. And so like when I did those cuts, man, the staff, you know, you, you just be as honest as you can with them and say, look, we prefer not to lay off people. So to do that, we're going to make some, some uh, salary cuts. And the blessing of the PPP is that once we got the PPP money, we were able to go back and pay back all the cuts that people made. And, and that is the way you help with the culture in helping companies, uh, employees want to be creative because you can't, an entrepreneur is great, and he, but he can't always do it alone. And if you have a team of people that are thinking entrepreneurially, you move a lot quicker. So I think the common bond on the go and the Zoom are the two things that really uh, pilot us to be in a good position. Now, the next part is that there's a lot of opportunities. Unfortunately, in the restaurant business, the weaker players are closing. So, you know, we're getting calls every day. Hey, come look at this space. Can you come over here? Can you move here? And it's the question of how quick do you move and which are the best opportunities. So for me, it's like there's quality that you are looking for opportunities that have quality. And I'm telling a lot of these landlords that call or these real estate agents and says, look, well, we can go pretty much anywhere, but we're not going to pay a dollar for the build out. You have to build out our restaurants and our restaurants are expensive to build. So, you know, those are the other kind of opportunities that we have because it's been a reset and how much they we're getting in rent three months ago, they might not get the same amount for rent today. And that's where I think entrepreneurs can, can, you know, take a little bit more risk because the overhead may not be as high. So hopefully that answered your question. Thanks, Al. Great, thanks, thanks George. And, and on to another uh, great restaurateur uh, out here in Fort Bend County where I'm at. And I think, uh, Robert, you were the Fort Bend County Business Person of the Year last year, if I remember correctly. And uh, I know that when this, very first started you start you jumped right on and started doing some very innovative you know things to benefit not only you know the restaurant your employees but the community as well so um, i know we appreciate everything that you've done out here and just if you can share with us some of your some of your you know strategies that you did as you got through this uh yeah sure thanks al uh so you know we were uh i think we were the first uh restaurants to to close our, our dining, uh, dining uh, seating uh, that I know of in, in our area. And uh, um, one of the reasons uh, that, that we could act that quickly is because, you know, we uh, we're only two partners that we've been together since 2001 and we understand one another uh, very well. So even though we had a weekly meeting, uh, it, where uh, most of my managers were hesitant to 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 sh you know shut the doors, uh, you know I had to kind of trust my judgment and go against uh, and 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 convince everybody that we needed to switch gears into optimizing our takeout game uh, that day. We couldn't wait, so so we had a choice of either being distracted by shuffling these uh uh on all these unknown factors with people coming in i mean do we wear masks or you know or we just cut cut to the chase uh and and get an early start so you know and like george said you you have all these plans in the background that you're thinking about doing you know we got to optimize this we got to move to to a digital scheduling app we have to up our to go game, our packaging, and uh, those we had thought of those just like like George mentioned, but uh, in one day we have to we had to change gears into rapid implementation of all these things. So so uh, you know one of the, the uh, like like we, you know we, uh, you know like like George, we are long term players, and our culture and our teams are the most important uh, elements of our businesses. I mean, they become family. So uh, we started a rotation 
uh, we didn't let anyone go and we, we, we uh, worked on a, a rotational schedule so that everybody uh, could get hours and uh, and we managed that that way until the, the PPP came in and then it was just a blessing to be able to tell everyone you know what here it is you, you're taken care of uh, that was a big game changer but yes, we had to uh, really move quickly and uh, we changed our uh, point of sale systems. Uh, we added modules for, for dining in and, when, and and this is, all this didn't happen in one day, but, but the implementation started uh, very quickly. Uh, Japan Airs was the last one to get a, 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 the online ordering uh, system, which was, you know, just recently this week, the other two uh were implemented earlier uh and uh, are and, and they, those were game changers so what we found is that as far as the restaurants go we estimate that with 50 percent uh seating uh inside and with the way we expanded our pat patios uh capacity if you add the the new revenue from this this uh, new uh, ordering tools, uh, we're going to get pretty close to the to to where we were before. I mean, and so whenever this thing passes, I think the the the, the those quick quickly implemented tools that we added as a as a the, the top layer to our uh, revenues are just going to be uh, something that we had would never it would never occur to us. That, that 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 could be the case that that could be that that good robert i'm now you can continue on yeah so okay. so uh so that was the the uh you know our established business and 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 the the reasons why we were able to get there and react quickly and take care of all of our uh employees was uh, because we, uh, well, again, we have no, no investors, no outside partners, and uh, we're in for the, for the uh, long term. And, uh, and we're able to uh, act quickly because we, uh, we don't have anyone to, to uh, we, we don't have any any outside uh, partners, like I said. Uh, we have, there's another business that we have that started a few years ago, and it's in the uh, uh, industrial cleaning uh, industry. And that business, we opened it up to other people, and more specifically, you know, some, some old friends of ours. And, uh, you know, uh, Victor and I, so, great opportunities in this, in this debacle that we're going through. Uh, but, uh, on, you know, we, there was some red tape that we, that we ran into with the other partners that we, that we brought in. And uh, so that energy that we have running our restaurant businesses wasn't uh, able to get ignited in, in this other company as a result after all this time uh, on, on and trying to 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 get this uh, this company moving and, and acquiring new clients and offering our disinfection uh, products and, and services and so on uh, has been very taxing uh, because our uh, other partners have been uh, paralyzed by fear and, uh, and and so that has been a very different uh, kind of experience. Victor and myself, we, uh, we've been through, I mean, we've had our fair share of failures before. I, I am officially 15 minutes, I mean, 15 years uh, on the rebound. I lost pretty much all my money in 2005, that maybe we can get into that later, but, uh, but we developed a thick skin and we know that uh, if you don't, you know, that you have to, you have to risk it and act quickly and, and that you can rebound. Uh, so, so that was my, my, my second uh, uh, story there. The third story that I wanted to tell is, uh, is about, okay, what was born uh, out, of, out of this, this thing? Uh, 
Uh, and uh, we had a, uh, uh, we've been planning a, a plant-based uh, whole foods concept uh, for a while. And we were actually looking at different uh, uh, leases uh, all over town. And, uh, and, and so we decided that we're going to, to incubate this concept as a ghost kitchen and, uh, and uh, you know, save a lot in, in, in rent uh and and other fixed expenses and so so we wouldn't have thought of 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 exploring this idea uh in in detail or in earnest if this whole thing hadn't happened and so when we started thinking about this a few things unraveled uh, one of them is that you know after searching for spaces you couldn't find one that was not small enough uh, where you didn't have, uh, you know, some extra room that you that you didn't need. Uh, so then we we thought, okay, well, if we do, if we if we finally somewhere in town, in a different market within Houston, uh, and we have excess room in the space, then we can actually grow our existing concepts through one uh, kitchen space, and offer our our you know three menus. Uh, to 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 customers outside uh, Fort Bend County, and so that was just a revelation. It, it, I, and I know it sounds simple uh, when you when you hear it, but it was you know we we didn't think about that before. So you know instead of uh, paying high rent to 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 explore other areas in the city, we can test the waters this way with a little bit less risk. Uh, and, and and see how it goes, and then we can we can actually start a you know either you know drive-throughs or or dining and and and, and see what happens. So uh, beyond that, when we when I was exploring the different uh, spaces and laying everything out, we still had some some room left over, uh, and and so my thought process went into packaging and you know our packaging currently is subpar i mean we use uh, uh pretty standard packaging for for our to-go foods and uh and they are you know and honest honestly honestly they could be a lot better uh things shuffle around in there uh they're they're too big too small uh things uh don't don't conserve the the, the, the quality uh, as well as could be. So now we're looking into uh, making our own packaging, custom made, uh, uh, custom fitting uh, precisely what we need for each of our uh, menu items. And then, you know, hopefully another business can spin off of this, which we could offer to other uh, restaurateurs who want to really up that game of their to go and, and 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 take the experience of dining into their places out to for, for takeout. So so that was uh, something that we could also uh, come up with because uh, we had that uh, uh, you know the buck stuck with us, so we can make these decisions. And uh, back in the, the first slide, I believe, where it says that that um if you leave below your means you actually get this freedom that so so george was saying okay the cash is king so because we were thrifty and we really paced our growth uh with a lot of common sense and not getting crazy uh we have no we accumulated we have zero debt uh in both personal or, or business so now we are, we're in that better position to, to tackle these this new challenges and take advantage of the opportunities. Uh, so so that, that's really important to, to, to set yourself up uh, and so that when crises like this happen, you're in a good, uh, good uh, cash position to take advantage. Thanks, Robert. I mean, great, great, great advice. Um, before we go on, if you're an entrepreneur or, or thinking of becoming an entrepreneur, the best place to start is is looking down the road to seasoned entrepreneurs like George, Robert, Susie, 
and, and others because uh, it, it's, it's a road that you learn a lot of lessons and Robert shared some great lessons with, with us on that, but you can really avoid a lot of, a lot of challenges and pitfalls, um, right? So Robert, uh, before we move on, uh, Sarah Brooke had a question uh, as to what type of uh, technology platform do you use for your, for your POS and delivery? Uh, sure. So, so we use Toast for our uh, for for one of the restaurants, and, and uh, CRS for for the others. And so, they had there has been a, a, a kind of a consolidation in that uh, industry, I guess. So, CRS uh, uh, merged with uh, other quick service platforms, and uh, they really upped the game uh, on the. Uh, uh, digital uh, order online and uh, process. So yeah, we use those two. We use uh, uh, CRS, which CRS slash prevention, and then Toast. Both are great. George? Yeah, we, uh, I don't want to talk negatively about Focus, but we were on Focus and the new location is on Toast and we're moving toward Toast because it's uh, actually one of the funders is Alphabet, Google, and they're very cloud-based, easy to operate, and they've done some amazing things with delivery and takeout because we were much, much like you were talking about earlier, is that we had to pivot to takeout and delivery, and we were only with, um, oh God, I'm going blank on the name, but one of the groups, and then the, we were in negotiation with Uber Eats, and Uber Eats rates are really too high for us, and so they were, because they had so much calls for Common Bond, they lowered their rates to us, and we were, about to sign up like on March 13th or whatever. And when this happened, they wanted to take pictures and it usually takes two or three weeks to get on their platform. And we called them that Monday and said, look, we need to be on the platform today. And so we rushed the process up and now we're on Grubhub and DoorDash and all those guys. But Toast actually has a way that you can press either delivery or takeout and you can have your own delivery drivers from that platform, that POS. So it's really, I've really been impressed with Toast. I've heard a lot about it lately. It's really a buzz in the marketplace with, with yeah. Toast. Um, here, here's a good question before we move on. I think I think we might. Um, I've, I've had this brought up a lot lately, and and, and Susie, you're you're in PR, and I, I I know Robert George are dealing with this, but you know, with the COVID coming back, right, being so uncertain, um, what? How do you handle the situation if someone at your workplace uh, I tests call, positive? I call my labor and employment attorney. And he helps me. I am not an expert on um, on dealing with COVID in the workplace, but uh, David Barron, our workplace attorney, has been out there daily uh, on all the national shows talking about just these issues. Al, this, George. Well, I'll just say that during the early parts of this, that was my biggest fear. It kept me up at night is the employees positive because then you have to quarantine all the people that they were in touch with. And I'll give you one scenario that really kept me up is a, one of our cooks showed up and says, Hey, my roommate tested positive. And we didn't know, or I didn't get told, but luckily he was with his girlfriend for like the last 11 days. We obviously sent him home that day and said, you come back with a negative test before you can return to work. And thank God, because he was with his girlfriend, it probably saved him and saved us because in a small kitchen, you could lose your whole staff for two weeks. And, you know, and so we've always tried to be very conservative. It's a great question. Like at our rehab centers, we were quick to get the, the, the uh, temperature gauges out from the get go. We had the questionnaires. Have you been to these places? You know, you've been around anybody that's been sick, had the flu and, and everybody takes the temperature at all our locations of both, both companies before they even walk in the door and have to answer this questionnaire every time because we are definitely gravely concerned about that part of it. One, we want them to be safe. And we have a lot of younger people, and so they're not as conservative as I'd like them to be when they leave the, the workplace. And so you have to be worried about that every day when they return to the workplace, because it, it can affect so much and throw basically throw out your business if, if one person comes back positive. So knock on wood, we've not had that issue. The one that, was, yeah, that was also my biggest fear. I'm sorry, Susan. Uh, I, I agree with George. I lost uh, sleep over that. And uh, I think one advantage, if you have a 
going back to the culture subject that George uh, mentioned, you know, it takes a, having fostered a good culture over the years to be able to get through people, get through your staff, uh, and and make them understand the importance of these things, and and really uh, keep tabs of of of, of everyone. Uh, so so it's it's very relevant to to play that long term game and to care for your for your staff uh, that way because if they feel that that you you're taking care of them they they will uh, you know be more mindful because they you know they're uh, less selfish. So the one thing that I have. Uh participated in is uh, with the uh, disinfectant shield. We're doing uh, stories coast to coast from LA to Boston as, as um, New England just opened up on Monday. We have been cleaning uh, with disinfectant shield uh, in each of those cities about to open in preparation so that we are assured, we only have control over certain things, but we need to be as business owners assured that people will not get COVID when they're inside your store. Nobody wants to go shopping, go to an eating establishment, go to a hairdresser, anything, if, if it hasn't been properly disinfected. So just to ensure, and it's a social responsibility, to ensure that not only the staff, but your customers are completely safe. And you can say that with 100% assuredness. Once they enter your establishment, it's clean. And gosh, I've learned so much about proper cleaning. Uh, if I could go off on a tangent just for a second, and please stop me if you want, guys, but I've learned an awful lot about plant-based uh, disinfectants, cleaners. Traditionally, I never would have put Lysol, Clorox, any of these things on my hands, on my skin, on my body, in my areas, because they're killing all the good and the bad bacteria and they're keeping us defenseless against future viruses. So what I have learned with uh, Disinfectant Shield is the fact that you've gotta make sure you know what you're cleaning with. Clorox just won't do it for the long term and uh, it may create more problems uh, in the long term with keeping employees healthy and safe. So watch out for your chemical-based products, your chemical kills, your salt-based products that will deteriorate the minute you put a Lysol or a Windex on it. And as a business owner, we just have to make sure we can control what we can. It's not always easy to know who our staff is spending time with, what they're doing, outside of the uh, workplace establishment. But if we can make sure we have proper cleaning mechanisms, we're masked, we're gloved, we're doing everything we can, then, then we are taking all the precautions we can take. Perfect. So Susie, on that, Bruce Bush is a former student of mine who came out and acquired his own small business. Uh, he and his wife acquired a great small business. What do, you, what do you do if your clients aren't behaving in a safe way? How do you encourage your, your, your clients uh, while well, they're in your establishments, right? So I think, we, I think we've got, you know, kind of two sides to this, right? You've got the people that are out wearing masks, very precautious, and the others are kind of the rebels, I'm gonna go out there and not do it. So how, how do you, and I guess, you know, the general policy, Robert and George, are you, are you requiring, you know, what are you requiring from your customers? And how are you handling yeah. that? We uh, we require a mask. It was interesting. We <laughs> we had a bad experience the first day that they allowed in-house dining. We had uh, an employee that was uh, a negative influence, and unfortunately, was terminated the next day, the Saturday. And his oh. girlfriend and groups of people were like picketing and saying we were unsafe because we had too many people in our restaurant. And they called the fire marshal, and they came out twice and said, "No, you don't have you you're." within your 25 percent and things like that and and because we went with the decision to allow the customers to choose to wear a mask or not and that was the first two days and the third day we said all right we're going to have mask for every customer we had mask at the door 
we had sanitizer at the door. So before they walked in, they had to make that choice. We lost a few customers that first day. And since then, they've been very, very compliant. They wear the mask, they come in, they're conscious of it. We've been fortunate, Bruce, that we have not had the anti-mask people come in and, and, and disrupt or cause problems. So if that does happen, we'll ask them not to, to ask them to leave the restaurant because that's our, one of our policies that you do wear a mask for the safety of the people around you. And when obviously when they're eating, they can take their mask off, but while they're in line or ordering or doing anything else, we ask that they keep the mask on. George, I would wear a mask if it meant getting one of your macarons too. <laughs> deal, <laughs> deal, Susie. <laughs> uh, in our case, yeah, we, we've required uh, all staff to, to follow the protocols and wear masks at, at all times. Uh, with the uh, with when we ramped up to patio uh, dining, uh, we what we did was we we basically expanded our patio and used uh, you know large distances to counter that. So if if anyone came and didn't want to wear a mask, everyone was within a safe distance uh, to counteract that. Uh, and, and so we we haven't been. Uh, requiring guests to, to wear masks uh, when they come. We uh, try to lead by example and, and you know, for, for the public to see that we are all wearing masks. And uh, so, so yeah, we, we haven't uh, reached that point uh, where we require our guests to, to wear masks. We're trying to uh, use the, the distance threshold uh, as as our uh, weapon to to you know avoid uh, to avoid uh, that problem. So Robert, I just uh, went and had dinner at Steak Forty Eight the other night. It was a wonderful experience. Everything was spanking clean, and uh, it was interesting because the entire staff was wearing black masks. They were gloved. They were so professional but the customers did not wear masks or gloves. So every, I think everybody's doing it in a different way, yeah. but keeping their distance and uh, it really does seem to help moving those tables and keeping everything a little bit separate and really sticking by that 25% rule. It is our tricky, the tricky part is gonna be the bars, right? Because the, the bars are different. And people go to a bar uh, to have a beer, a glass of wine, and you know what happens if it's uh, you know two three people going to get to a bar right uh, it, it's it, it that that becomes a little bit awkward so that's the that's one of the elements that we're kind of tackling with right uh, as we speak we're okay do we just keep the bars uh close and take all the bar stools out of there uh, until further notice because you know that uh, people are, are uh, there's such pent up demand for people to get out there and have drinks with friends that it's a, it, it's a, a uh, it's going to get interesting trying to tell people, okay, you know, you sit here, you sit there and, 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 and drink your beers that, that way. So that can get contentious and maybe the best policy will be to avoid bar sitting altogether. Interesting. So along those lines, guys, we had a question that came up, and I, I know you're all great, great business people. Um, I've known you all a long time. Uh, you know, the downside of all this, right, the decrease in demand, the, the, the decrease in revenue, uh, inevitably going to come. What, what are you doing as far as the realities of business? Cost cutting, saving expenses, right? Um, George, what are, you, what are you doing on that? Absolutely. Everything is negotiable at this point. And I think you have to look Even at your every, macaroons. Not, not on our side, but on, <laughs> on the, on the expense side, not on the revenue side, we need more revenue out. Um, everything on the expense side is, is uh, negotiable. And it was funny because we get a flower from a company out of San Antonio and we've been getting it for six years. We've been open six years and they are one of the largest bakery supply companies in the three states, Oklahoma, Texas, and Louisiana. And so we actually went to San Antonio last week and showed them, we think six or eight 
products that we serve that they can they can sell from a wholesale level. So and not only that, in this negotiations, they've already lowered their cost of the flour and things that we use that they sell to us. So I think it's you're looking at relationships and who you work with and how to make it work for everybody. So it's a win win. And you know, everybody's concerned about cash flow. So how do you help with that? And how can you work smarter instead of harder? We've always heard that, but how do you actually really do it? And to reach out to people. I mean, I, I've been reaching out to HEB. I want to sell my macaroons to HEB and I hand delivered them to San Antonio for the lady to try them. So hopefully you'll see common bond macaroons in the uh, HEBs one day. <laughs> Good question for that, George. You know, I, I, I'm, I have a different slant on this because I'm, I'm, a, I'm I think I'm the only service provider uh, right here in this panel um not a restaurant but uh this has been you know be, with three offices uh across the country this has been an amazing time to get all of my people together we have never been as much one unit as we are today so we have three or four check-ins a day morning check-in night check-in now this is not great for some of the employees yeah that aren't used to checking in. But we've been doing lunch and learns. We've been so much more together as a team, depending on each other and uh, working together instead of being in siloed offices. So it has just, it has been wonderful for, for the service business, our service business. Al, uh, uh, your, your last question, uh, I, that's one of the reasons why I put uh, on the, my, my first point in the uh, slide is to play long-term long -term games with the long-term people. So if you have a, a well-established relationship with your supply chain uh, and, and you're not playing uh, short, the, the, the short-term game of, of hustling them into, you know, uh, lowering price uh, at a rate that it's, uh, you know, unrealistic and jumping around supplier to supplier, you know, the, it, it really, it really uh, makes a big difference. So, you know, we've had suppliers uh, relationship for, for, you know, 10 going on to 20 years. Uh, and those are people that you can in a very relaxed way sit down and have a conversation and uh you know you you've gotten to know them and uh i i you know recommend uh you know every entrepreneur to to really foster those relationships uh especially with the two three or four major players in your supply chain uh the ones that uh that take the, the biggest chunk out of your your expenses and if you if you reach that level of trust uh, where they know you're, you're not going to jump around uh, and, and, and you know that they're going to, you know, uh, come back for you. Uh, it makes a big difference, big, big difference. So. Yeah, you know, Robert, I'd really like to add that I was in the printing and business forms uh, business for, for years and we had our core paper suppliers in Houston go in our downturn. We would, we could always go to our key suppliers and work with them on cutting our prices but then as things pick back up we needed rush orders we took care of them too so i think what you said that relationship and giving some of the opportunity versus shopping and, and right i'm gonna you gotta lower it by here you'd be surprised if people will really really work with you and, and those long-term relationships really matter because then when you need product in tough times they take care of you right yeah and the so idea of compounding time. compounding is not just compounding interest right Compounding effects apply to relationships, uh, and it's 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 a force of nature. I mean, it's it's a, it's an amazing uh, factor in in long term success. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think you know, tough times like this bring out the best in people and the worst in people. The best in people, I mean, you hear sharing, sharing ideas, being innovative, coming out with that, right? And it's an opportunity to, to, to shine as well, right? And everyone's got to get through it together when you get through it. When this started, I called every landlord and reached out to every landlord. And they're so great because you could see how they all responded. You know, some were like helpful and some were like not so helpful. 
but I had one landlord. He was really great. He, they gave us 50% off of the April rent. But then he, once he realized about the PPP, he, he called me back and said, Hey, if you get PPP, can you pay me back the money? I just discounted you for the half off the rent. And I said, I'm, he said, I'm going to send you an email. Can you confirm that you will give me back my, my rent? So I had to pay him back for the half off rent he gave me for April. So everybody's thinking that how to protect themselves, obviously. Yeah, but you're right, Jeremy. People sometimes lose the fact that it's people, right? You're dealing with people on their side, and it just it's common sense helping them out, taking care of them, them taking care of you, being honest with them, being straight up with them, and letting them know. And right, that, that that's a big that's a big part of it. Uh, you know, we had another question that came in on priority, right? There's a lot a lot going on. So can you talk about what you might have deprioritized during this time and what you prioritized, right? So I can take that first. Um, the, the one thing that I prioritize since the very, very beginning in my business is making sure my employees were safe and, and happy. And I remember in February, uh, during our Monday meeting calls, I said, I know you guys think I'm crazy, uh, but you know, I am. <laughs> I want you all to go out and buy all the toilet paper and uh, goods you're gonna need for at least two weeks. And now that since- was That was February, huh? Now <laughs> since we're and yes. <laughs> but it was managing to get all those employees out of New York before, uh, before it got really, really bad. Uh, get them out of Chicago, get them to their um, uh, whatever family homes or wherever they were going to be hunkering down, and then making sure they had food, making sure they had fresh fruit, like weekly, <laughs> making sure they, they were taken care of, because uh, the priority for my team became a 24-7 job. We are almost you know 24-7 uh, feeding news for my clients to the media. So, uh, and media, all media stories related to COVID and what's going on right now, uh, and uh, being a funnel to the newsroom. So this was literally 24 seven and has been uh, on week, still on week 10. Uh, and, uh, but making sure they're all safe in the process. Um, one of my employees' husbands is a firefighter in New York and they're living in a one bedroom and he got COVID. Uh, one of my employees has it right now in Florida. So uh, again, what, what you guys mentioned about you just never knew who, who is coming into your home, whether they're a delivery guy, the mail person, the, um, the person to fix the plumbing, anybody, because you don't know who they were with. This reminds me of uh, the you know, other pandemics, right? That you just don't know who they've been with. Uh, and, um, and then you're exposed. So, so uh, again, a priority has been keeping our folks safe and then uh, working as a really close, close unit to make sure that everybody is, is it, it's like a well-oiled um, engine. Lisa. Thanks. Uh, in, in our case, what I would say to that question, uh, Stephanie, is um, uh, we prioritize uh, first principles and deprioritize fluff. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you really activate uh, your, your critical thinking going back to first principles. You have to go back to those basic items in your balance sheet and your income, uh, uh, profit and loss. And you, got, you have to uh, question the why you're doing certain things in your, uh, within your operations. And, and, and so, so you prioritize first principle thinking and systems uh, and, and uh, and you deprioritize uh, everything else. You have to. And, and the most important thing 
to deprioritize, in my opinion, when you're hit with a circumstance like this that we're all in, is you have to deprioritize uh, this information and uh, the blast from from uh, all uh, uh, you know information coming at you 24 hours or seven. It's so easy to get distracted uh, with with everything coming at you uh, of you know the different uh, uh, you know X many many people are uh, you know tested and this and that and trying to figure out all the statistics. You can get lost in all that. So you know prioritize first principles, basic principles, systems uh, within your uh, your organization. Uh, and, and within those systems go down to the mo most basic principles uh, and, and, and you, you need to make the shifts from from there and and forget all the fluff. Thanks Rob. Well, maybe we've quickly come up on, uh, on one o'clock and again I, I can't just thank you guys enough. So much knowledge and wisdom collectively. So uh, Susie and George you're an EO, Robert EO, we sometimes end uh, when we're uh, kind of wrapping up with a one word close one word so we don't we don't have five minute summary but just a one word close susie what's your one word close grateful george you took my word so now it's uh that's uh, why i wanted to go first <laughs> <laughs> now it's uh, opportunity Robert. Oh, you guys took my two <laughs> top words <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say energy keep your energy energy all right i'm gonna end it thank you that's two words thanks thanks <laughs> thank you guys yeah, thank, thank th you thank you so so much go to stop by common bond if you're out in sugarland japan arrows sure. thank you very much and any pr susie thank you thank you al al thank, thank you great you, job uh, it was fantastic everybody. thank you guys robert susie great job Thank well, you. Appreciate the opportunity, Al. Thank you so it, it, much. It was really fun. That was great. Thank, thank you. It's perfect, man. It's inspiration. Robert, since you said change the light bulb, that's become my mantra now. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking the dogs for 100 yards, and then I'm going beyond.